begin to discuss what's going on out west. Okay? And your book refers to the west at this point as the New West. And the only thing that really makes it new is the fact that it's finally being uh, industrialized. Okay? It's being settled by, um, by white settlers who are coming from the east. They're trying to escape the war. They're trying to uh, look for better economic opportunities. Um, and this is not necessarily something that's brand new either in terms of settlement. Okay? Uh, people have been settling out west at this point. Um, if we're talking about the 1890s, probably for the better part of the last 60 or even 70 years. Okay, so that's not a, not necessarily a new area of settlement. Those who have migrated out west before the Civil War and before Reconstruction are virtually untouched by it. Um, they might have had one or two instances where um, Union Army officials will appear, perhaps if they are uh, being called out to fight Native Americans for some reason. Uh, they might have gotten some kind of economic um, uh, boost or downturn as a result of the war, but uh, really there is uh, not really a whole lot of law and order to speak of out west, uh, at least before the war happens. Okay, so. Most of the conflict that is taking place out west has to do with settlers uh, against Native Americans and against um, uh, Native Mexicans who are still actually occupying much of the west uh, even after the Civil War occurs. Okay, We actually begin to absorb most of the territory that was part of Mexico um, before the Mexican-American War sometime around 18, the 1840s or 1850s. So there's, there's still kind of a, a gradual um, shift in population. By 1900, though, about one-third of all Americans are living west of the Mississippi River. Okay, it's, it's, people are finally starting to expand into the territory, and now that there's not really um, so much competition anymore over the, the fate of what these new states are going to be like in terms of their economy and so forth, and now especially that the 13th Amendment has passed and slavery is over, there's no more armed conflict over whether these new states are going to be slave or free states. They're all free states. Okay, so it kind of um, uh, expedites, I guess, the situation. And again, if you are a white settler going out west, the primary thing that you're after is some kind of economic opportunity and or personal freedom. Okay, Whether it's uh, religious, uh, in some cases there are some religious sects that have been moving out west already, like I said before, for the past you know several uh, decades at this point, uh, the Mormons being one of them. And uh, of course, you know, now that the gold rush has been going on since 1848, 1849, um, we have a, a span of probably about 40 or 50 years now where that's been going on and uh, California is kind of the, the central location for, for people to migrate to. And again, because the, of the presence of whites and because of this large, virtually untapped or un, um, uh, unadulterated, un, uh, unindustrialized area of the country, uh, it seems like whites take a lot of liberty uh, with uh, with nature itself, with changing the ecology, with hunting, uh, and with um, attacking and uprooting Native American culture. Uh, it's uh, it's really, uh, in hindsight, it seems to have done more harm than good. The Great Plains, of course, is the region that we know of being the kind of the central chunk of the United States, right? Uh, if you live here in uh, North Texas, as we do, right, those of us who are uh, in, in this particular class, right, we know that this entire area from North Texas all the way up into Wyoming, Montana, straight up the corridor here in the United States is all open prairie. Okay, so everything from western Kansas and Nebraska through Oklahoma, the Dakotas, and eastern Colorado, all of it is considered Great Plains. And um, occasionally what will happen when it comes to migration is not everybody is bound for California or for Oregon necessarily. Okay, uh, through one means or another, right, people end up stopping along the way, whether it's through necessity or simply the fact that they like the country side that they've landed in, whatever the case may be. Um, and sometimes people will even migrate backwards the opposite direction, right? If they get all the way to California, realize they don't like it, they might turn around and go back a little bit, okay? So individuals who are minors, perhaps, from California, um, and even uh, Chinese immigrants who have landed in California, sometimes they go east a little bit more, right? See what else is out there, okay? Um, 
And uh, of course, if you're uh, if you're a cowboy, if you've landed in Texas, you don't like it here. You end up moving perhaps to some place like Utah or Nevada, um, depending on what the land is like and what exactly it is you're you're out for. And of course, the fact that this particular portion of the United States is um, so dramatically different, I guess you could say, than the rest of the country in terms of the weather, uh, in terms of the environment itself, um, people struggle quite a bit, um, uh, especially going you know, down the Oregon Trail and so forth. When they cross this particular part of the country, sometimes it's referred to as the Great American Desert. And Desert doesn't necessarily mean sand and cactus and that kind of thing, right? A desert is basically just a large, uninhabited area where very little food grows, okay? So it's just a, a desolated place, okay? Um, and the Great Plains is kind of the, the central portion of that, right? You have nothing but prairie for hundreds and hundreds of miles in any direction, okay? It's like being lost at sea, right? If, if you don't pick a direction and go there long enough, you will end up wandering in circles virtually forever. Um, and whites at this point don't typically stop very often in uh, in this portion in this uh, American desert situation, right? They believe that uh, if they can find an area where natural resources are more abundant, they'll be more likely to settle there. So again, there's not really much incentive to stay on the plains, right? There's no cover in case a storm happens, right? If you live in tornado alley, as we do, right, you know you have to find a place to, to run and hide in case something like that happens, okay? And in the Great Plains, there are no trees, right? It's nothing but open prairie grass, okay? Flat ground, not even really any caves or, or, or cover of any kind to speak of. Okay, so you're, you're literally out in the open, uh, exposed to the elements at all times. Okay? So, uh, and even things like a, a simple water source, right? A, a river, a stream, a lake, a pond, something like that. Very difficult to find, quite frankly, and, and that's part of what uh, lumps it in as, as a desert of sorts. And eventually, the further you go in a certain direction, right, during this time period, you'll end up running into a, a pocket of natural resources that might give you more incentive to stay there. Okay, so uh, a lot of people, especially those who are looking for um, some kind of economic boost or looking for something like gold or silver, some kind of natural ore or, or mineral that they can uh, mine and eventually sell at markets, something like that, copper, iron, or even... Um, even a natural resource like coal, for example, or even timber, if they can find it, right? They go far enough west and so forth. Um, the one thing that is in a lot of abundance during this period in, in the Great Plains is buffalo. Uh, and um, it's, it's something that ends up going into extremely sharp decline once we get past the Civil War, especially because there's more people moving west. And uh, buffalo hides, in particular, are extremely lucrative. So you might have uh, large groups of white hunters who will actually hunt entire herds of buffalo, um, skin them, and leave the carcasses out in the sun to rot. Okay, and the the, the meat at, at that point is is no good. Okay, so um, and of course. We'll talk more about this once we get to speaking specifically about the buffalo and how they relate to Native Americans, but um, it's, it's a devastating effect on, on Native American culture and, uh, on again, on the ecology itself. Um, one thing that is eventually brought in and that also changes the ecology is the, um, the necessary uh, irrigation techniques to actually be able to grow something because the, the soil itself might actually be uh, fairly fertile, right? You might actually, I mean, it's, the Midwest is, is prime farmland. It's all flat ground. Um, you can run a plow through it and, and all that kind of stuff and actually have you know, crops and so forth working. But um, problem too is that uh, because the land itself has never been worked, okay? And, and when I say never, I mean never in the history of humanity has it been worked. Um, so much of the grassroots that actually exist underground are, are strong enough and have been there since essentially the beginning of time. So um, in, in many cases, uh, grassroots will actually end up breaking plows as a, as a direct result. So um, it's, it's not necessarily easygoing, right? The, the land is not pre-tilled, if you like. And again, most settlers who go out west, again, typically are, are white settlers, okay? They have the means to do this, right? They have a horse and wagon like the family you see in the background here. Uh, they might have enough supplies to be able to get them out west, right? They have the means to do it, okay? And it's, uh, it's expensive and it's dangerous, okay? So if you are already ill-equipped, right, if we, like what we saw with the, uh, the Donner Party several decades before, if you've had me for 1301, we discussed that, but... 
Um, it's, uh, there's all kinds of risks involved with going west, no matter what route you take. And three quarters of the settlers that do go west are male. Okay, Many of them are accompanied by their families. There's very few single western um, Western bound settlers who are men who go by themselves. Okay, you might have a few who work for the railroad and use that as their ticket to get out west, but will end up kind of breaking off and staying there once they get there. But those who are independent typically bring their families. Um, and most of the settlers also are not necessarily native born, right? A lot of them are actually foreign immigrants who come from northern Europe and sometimes even come from Canada. So once you see um, areas in the northern plains of the United States and on up into the Great Lakes region especially, um, you'll notice that much of the, the culture, even today in the 21st century, uh, harkens back to Germanic, Scandinavian, and Irish uh, immigrants in many ways because that's where a lot of them ended up settling. Okay? A lot of the area is actually um, very similar to the climate that they came from. Okay? So it's, uh, it's kind of a, a, a unique reminder of home, I suppose. By 1870, it's estimated that about one-fourth of the Nebraska population is actually foreign-born as well. Okay, we don't typically consider that being a thing today. And uh, again, if you, if you go to Nebraska, it's, <laughs> it's fairly desolate uh, in terms of that. Uh, in 1890, 45% of North Dakota residents are immigrants too. Okay, so again, kind of that upper region of the United States uh, on up closer to Canada. And those numbers probably include mostly Canadians who have come south as well. Um, Canada had been uh, a nation for only a very short amount of time by this point. Uh, the Dominion of Canada, I think, actually was established sometime in the 1850s. Um, and before then, it was still just a commonwealth of, uh, of Great Britain shared with France in terms of the territory and so forth. But not until the 1850s was it actually consolidated. Um, and we've already talked a little bit about Chinese immigrants as it relates to uh, specifically the Transcontinental Railroad, but uh, Chinese immigration hit a gi gigantic spike uh, over the course of just under 20 years, right, from 1876 to 1890. Um, 200,000 Chinese immigrants come to California in particular to work for the railroad, uh, again, as temporary immigrants, right? They believe that if they saved up enough money, were able to travel back home, they could live as, as wealthy men, okay? But um, because of the, the working situation, the harsh conditions and so forth, um, the, the, the lack of economic opportunity and upward mobility, really, um, they're kind of stuck where they are in many cases. And the prejudice is extremely intense, um, so much so when the violence gets so thick and so heavy that by the time we get to 1882, uh, Congress decides it's going to pass what it calls the Chinese Exclusion Act. Okay, and this is a, a really devastating form of legislation that um, is uh, is really a sign of the times at this point. Right, there's a large nativist response that starts to come about during the late 19th century and early 20th centuries uh, against immigration for the first time. Okay, and it's typically uh, a response by um, the working class who, uh, again, are, are already hard up for jobs, right? They're, they're losing jobs because of, um, of injuries, of illness, of, you know, uh, being associated with organized labor, whatever the case may be. And a lot of the immigrants during this time period are so eager and so desperate for work that they don't, um, they don't cause the quote-unquote troubles, the problems that organized uh, labor ends up causing. So uh, there's... Uh, a, a bigger pushback by the working class, so much so that the federal government ends up having to respond because of uh, a lot of violent outbreaks that occur. Okay, the Sandlot incident that we talked about in chapter 17 is one such incident. And the worst part about this too is that it's not something that goes away anytime soon. Okay, the Chinese Exclusion Act is renewed about every four years, all the way up until um, I, I believe it's uh, it's 1943 or four that they actually end up relenting and allowing Chinese immigrants into the United States again. And there is a, a term specifically for uh, African Americans who pack up and move out west as well. Um, why there's a, a, a necessary need for a term, I'm not quite sure, but they're referred to as exodusters. Um, I, I suppose for the fact that they're, um, they're, they're getting into a dust up and leaving, <laughs> essentially, is, is all I can think of. But. Um, it's basically after the collapse of radical republicanism uh, in the U.S. government, and especially after congressional reconstruction um, ends once Rutherford B. Hayes is elected president, they realize there's really not a whole lot of hope when it comes to staying in the South. 
Okay, and they're they're trying uh, in in a desperate attempt really to escape the prejudice and the lynchings and all that kind of stuff and move out west uh, in hopes that things are going to be better there. And sometimes they are, and sometimes not. Uh, one particular case study that you see in this particular time period is a guy named uh, Benjamin Singleton. He's nicknamed Pap Singleton. Um, and Pap leads a, a party of about 200 black colonists uh, into Kansas where they actually establish a colony in Dunlop in Kansas in 1878. So um, there's uh, – and that's the other thing about this too is that uh, – uh, migrants who are moving from the east to the west typically don't um, pack up in very small groups. Okay, it's usually uh, almost like a small town uh, packing up and leaving together. There's usually not just one covered wagon by itself, like Little House on the Prairie or anything. Right? It's usually uh, several dozen wagons moving in a wagon train out west. And so, um, Pap Singleton is probably more representative of what you would typically see uh, if you. Uh, if you go out west. Um, and they're the, these uh, wagons are referred to at the time as prairie schooners, okay? And a schooner is a type of ship, right? So just like the, the prairie itself is like an open sea, right? These wagons are very much like ships. And the, the white covering that you typically see over the top of the wagon looks like a sail. Um, and the other thing, too, is that um, southern whites have kind of this same... Um, uh, the same response, but kind of in an opposite way uh, as the working class does toward immigrants. Okay, a lot of Southern whites who are desperately clinging uh, with with dying, gripping hands and fingers uh, to the the situation of the sharecropping institution of trying to keep uh, you know thinly veiled slavery in place. Right, they're having a lot of trouble keeping uh, African Americans in the same place. Right, because you know black people black people are finally starting to realize that this is not going anywhere, right? That they don't have a future doing this for very long. And so the desire to pack up and move, many of them end up just doing it in the middle of the night, uh, just trying to at least get away uh, from all this because if they leave during the day, they might be pursued by the clan and hunted down and either brought back or killed, right? So there's, um, it's, it's a desperate escape attempt is really what it amounts to. Um, and of course, you know, going out west is an extreme gamble in and of itself, right? In some cases, it's out of the frying pan and into the fire. Okay, there's all kinds of uh, potential problems with living on the prairie, right? You might have everything from, um, you know, again the the intense storms that you see in the in the Midwest, and then uh, you know, again the tornado alley and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you might have drought. You might have starvation. Animal attacks. Indian attacks. There's all kinds of issues that could potentially happen. Um, and it's a great big risk, right? And especially if you're desperate enough to get away from an institutionalized form of racism that doesn't appear to be going anywhere anytime soon, this is your best and only alternative. And by 1890, the, the sheer numbers of people who end up packing up and leaving start to reflect that desperation. Okay, there's over half a million African Americans living west of the Mississippi River by the time we get to 1890. And 25% of cowboys, uh, and this is not uh, ever really represented, of course, in, in film and TV shows and stuff like that, 25% of cowboys are African American. Okay, there's that, there's that big of a presence in it. And again, this is another form of, um, of unskilled labor, if you like, I guess, right? Anybody can learn how to ride a horse and how to herd cattle or sheep or whatever the case may be. And even um, several federal horse soldiers are also black, even though that tends to get whitewashed in a lot of the, um, the Hollywood versions that you end up seeing. Of course, mining from the time that the gold rush actually begins in 1849 all the way up through the end of the 19th century, mining is kind of the, um, the key feature of life out west, right? That's what most people are doing. They're leaving to go strike it rich out west. Okay. Um, beginning in 1849, right, you see these miners who end up going out there on their own, prospectors who try to uh, dig or pan for gold by hand in riverbeds. Um, and in 1849, it is much more possible to, to be able to simply walk down a riverbed in, in California somewhere in an uninhabited area and literally pick up chunks of gold off the ground as big as your fist. Okay, So th it's, it's obvious to find that kind of... Um, draw to, to out west, right? As soon as someone starts spreading the stories about that, it's just a, an absolute explosion overnight. 
And so these individual prospectors, like um, you know, some guy, some old man with a long beard and a pickaxe with a mule going out west, eventually gives way to mass production. Okay, because the deposits inside of these mountains and in the mines themselves, and even just in the riverbeds, uh, eventually get completely exhausted. Right, these people end up you know, taking as much as they can possibly carry and as much as a mule can carry and make multiple trips. And eventually corporations end up coming out um, and mass production is underway. And we start to see the first instance of something that's very similar to uh, the fracking controversy that you see in uh, in the 21st century, okay, in which the uh, these big mining corporations begin to actually use hydraulic cannons, okay, and what they're doing really is um, hydraulic cannons are using, of course, high-pressure water to, to blast away the rock themselves and the topsoil, okay? Uh, trying to find gold and silver veins inside of mines, uh, on mountainsides, right? They think if they can blast away enough rock and so forth uh, from the side of a mountain that perhaps, you know, an absolute gigantic vein of gold or silver is going to suddenly pop up out of nowhere. And again, this ends up completely changing the ecology uh, more so than they expect and really destroying it in many cases. Um, because again, the more water you spray, right, it creates uh, avalanches, it creates mudslides. Uh, and especially if you have farmers who have settled in a valley below a mountainside, if you spray enough water, <laughs> of course, into that particular area, uh, or something like that, it's going to completely choke the farmland, right? It's going to flood farm areas, and you're going to end up with a small lake, essentially, at the bottom of everything. Um, and sandbars get created as well. So if you have uh, certain areas where uh, the sand will actually end up choking uh, the soil itself, and then nothing will grow there afterward. So it's uh, it's much more, has a much bigger long-term effect than, than the miners probably anticipated, or at least bigger than they cared about. And about 12 billion tons of earth is removed from the Sierra Nevada mountains during this period. And that's, that's a massive amount, more so than you can imagine, right? Uh, the size of several mountains <laughs> being completely um, destroyed, being completely removed from the face of the earth. And you start hearing the term boomtown thrown around a lot during this period as well. Um, a boomtown is a town that becomes successful due to some kind of a resource that's extremely plentiful. And it typically has to do with a mining operation nearby, uh, something like gold or silver, uh, something along those lines. Um, uh, Tombstone, Arizona is, is one of the more famous ones, again, because of Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. If you've ever seen the, the Tombstone film right from the early 90s, right, it's, it's indicative of all that. Right? It's a town that becomes a, a small cosmopolitan area in the midst of, again, the, the great American desert, right? There's nothing for miles and miles around, but all of the wealth that's being accrued by, uh, by the silver operation uh, outside of Tombstone just turns the city into a, a, a giant, you know, oasis overnight, okay? And Tombstone is particularly unique because it has a, a lot of modern things that you uh, probably couldn't even find in many northeastern cities, okay? Things like a bowling alley, uh, Tombstone has four different churches, a school, two different banks, three newspapers, an ice cream parlor, 110 saloons, okay? That can't be overstated, right? 14 gambling halls, dance halls, and brothels. I mean, it's anything you could potentially want <laughs> out of a town like this, um, you have it and more. Um, and there's plenty of other places like this as well. Um, uh, one place in particular in Colorado uh, is called Silverton. Okay, and Silverton gets its name obviously from um, a, a silver mining operation that was supposed to be, uh, again, to, it was supposed to create Silverton as a boom town during the time period. And the silver load ended up drying up so quickly that now Silverton really relies on tourism more than anything else to keep its economy going because there's really nothing to speak of around there. And the town itself might have um, only a few hundred inhabitants. Okay, So uh, areas like that have had their entire economy changed. Um, and some of them are successful at first and end up drying up over time. Okay, uh, So it's, a, it's a, a weird dynamic that you start to see. Um, and boomtowns typically are male-dominated, right? The the fact that we have 110 saloons and gambling halls and brothels and all that kind of stuff kind of is suggestive of that. 
Um, and there's a lot of ethnic prejudice in these, okay? There's, there's a lot of uh, white supremacy, unfortunately, that gets transported over. And it's not necessarily white supremacy born out of the same system as the slavery system, necessarily. It's, it's not necessarily directed toward African Americans. It's directed more toward um, Mexicans and Chinese immigrants, in particular, because of the working class and the railroad and and those types of situations. So it's um, it's uh, I, I won't call it a different animal because it is kind of the same thing, but it's uh, it's approached from a different angle and from a different perspective, I guess. Um, and like I said, some of these cities that uh, start out being incredibly popular, incredibly successful, just end up dying out virtually overnight. Uh, Virginia City in Nevada is one of the most famous examples of that. Uh, in 1870, it had a population of 20,000 people. It was the, uh, the richest town in the country at that point. And then once all of the gold dried up, all of the, the mining deposits and everything dried up, everybody moved away. And now in the 21st century, there's a population of less than 1,000 people there. Okay, so some of these places, uh, they, they call them boom towns because they boom up really quick, and just like an explosion, it peters out over time. Um, one of the gentlemen who is most famous and for whom uh, a great fortune is named is Henry Comstock. Okay? Henry Comstock is the fellow who uh, discovers what is known as the Comstock load of gold and silver near Virginia City, and that's really what puts the city on the map in the first place. Um, it's one of the largest gold and silver deposits in the United States and really anywhere in the world. Okay? And it's, uh, it's part of what, uh, again, leads a lot more people to gravitate toward the area. Um, and uh, Virginia City, Nevada, of course, is right near the, uh, if I'm not mistaken anyway, it's right near the California border. And so it's simply a hop over the border into the area. And by 1876, California is actually admitted as a state. Okay? California claims independence um, from Mexico uh, pretty early on, not too long after the, um, uh, the gold rush actually occurs in 1849. I think it happens either in 49 or 50 that it uh, claims independence as the Republic of California, kind of along the same lines as what Texas does. And then California is eventually admitted as a state uh, into the Union in 1876. By 1888, uh, the Republicans uh, start gaining a lot more of a foothold in legislative races. So um, the, there's still a, a holdover from the Civil War and from pr before the Civil War, really, uh, of the Democratic Party trying to basically push for um, opposition in adding states because a lot of the Democrats at this point in time still represent the, the leftovers of the Confederacy. Right? They're still holding on to the hope that maybe if we can establish a new area, maybe we could somehow bring slavery back, right? There's still that backwards mobility in, in, this, in, in this particular mindset, uh, at least among the Democratic Party at this time. So um, now that the Republicans, though, have taken over Congress, they, they have kind of more of a, a forward mobility. And uh, even a forward mobility at this point in time is not necessarily a good thing either, okay? We've already seen uh, the after effects of, um, of big business and the Republican Party joining forces and all this. So um, it's, uh, it's kind of like, do you want a sharp stick up the nose or do you want one in the ear? Right? <laughs> there's, there's not really a good answer here. Um, and other states, of course, get added to the Union over time as well. We have North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Montana, and Washington in 1889, Idaho and Wyoming in 1890, and Utah finally is introduced as a state into the Union in 1896 after the Mormon Church agrees to stop polygamy. Okay, that's the the only holdout that prevents it from being added because uh, uh, Brigham Young and his followers refuse to to give it up. <laughs> so, um, so it's a long drawn out process, but they eventually get added. And Oklahoma gets added in 1907. Okay, so. Uh, most of the Union at this point is pretty well rounded out now, right? We've, we've added just about all of the continental states into the Union now. Um, Alaska doesn't get added until the 1950s, uh, and Hawaii gets added uh, in the, uh, in the uh, 1890s, and we'll talk about that in another couple of chapters as well. And Arizona and New Mexico in 1912, so that is what essentially rounds out the, the bottom southwest portion of the Union. The cattle boom, of course, is another thing that occurs kind of in the, um, the southwest and the, the south midwest portion, I guess, of the United States. 
Um, Spaniards are the ones who brought wild cattle to the Americas for the first time. There really wasn't that much of a, a presence uh, here in the United States of, of any kind of cattle aside from buffalo, of course. Um, and the, the Spaniards' uh, wild cattle and their horses actually end up competing with buffalo uh, in Texas and Arizona for food sources in a lot of instances. So that's kind of part of the beginning, I guess, of the downturn uh, in terms of that. But buffalo are still just as thick as you can imagine um, all throughout the Midwest in, the, in, in Kansas and in Nebraska and all those areas in the Great Plains. And... Um, of course, over time, once the wild cattle begin to be bred with domesticated cattle, right, we end up with longhorns, which, of course, as most people know, is kind of the the state animal, I guess, of Texas, or the, the representative animal. And we have millions of these things wandering around Texas after the Civil War has ended, okay? And so it's no surprise that it becomes adopted very quickly as kind of this symbolic creature. Um, and the market for beef in cities is not very big um, until the railroad comes about for, for pretty obvious reasons because um, meat spoils pretty quickly <laughs> when there's no refrigeration and no real means of preserving it. Um, I mean, you can salt beef, uh, preserve it in a barrel of salt or something like that. Uh, it'll eventually dry out and it will eventually turn into jerky more so than anything else. But if you're looking for steak or something along those lines, you have to do it quick, right? You have to be able to harvest the meat and cook it virtually in the same day. So it's a, there's, it's a, it's not a very expedient and not a very convenient process. Um, once the railroad comes into play, though, railroads, of course, have the ability to transport goods very quickly from one area to the next. And so now there's actually um, the potential for a marketability for, for beef. You can actually transport it from one city to the next, perhaps from one state to the next, uh, depending on how quickly you can get it there. And the Kansas Pacific Railroad uh, starts to lay rails in buffalo country, okay, so because people start to realize just how lucrative um, buffalo hides are, buffalo meat in certain cases, uh, and Abilene, Kansas actually has its own little uh, market junction where people will actually uh, bring cattle, they'll bring buffalo, and actually will um, harvest the meat and all that kind of in that particular area. Um, Joseph McCoy, who's a livestock dealer from Illinois, actually begins to uh, set up 250 acres for a stockyard in this particular area. And so that's why in places like Fort Worth here in Texas, um, and of course uh, places like Abilene in Kansas and so forth, and Chicago eventually over time, um, the railroad actually ends up running right up next to uh, stockyards. So we end up being able to load cattle and unload cattle from trains in order to, uh, again, send them to slaughterhouses or whatever the case may be. And cattle in particular are sent to Chicago slaughterhouses by rail um, uh, upwards of uh, three quarters of a million by the time we get to 1871 on an annual basis, right? So there's lots and lots of cattle um, being being transported. And of course, the, the, the epithet cow town is something that gets established in almost every single state, okay? Fort Worth is, is nicknamed cow town for this very reason. And of course, places like Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, right, all these places have a cow town of some sort with, uh, with the stockyard that ends up linking up with the railroad and eventually to slaughterhouses somewhere along the line. Uh, in 1883, it's estimated that there's half a million cattle in Montana alone just because of the, um, the sheer number of people who are, who are taking part in the trade. And eventually, over time, because there are so many cattle and because people start to kind of infringe on each other's property, cattle ranchers kind of have to come up with their own little codes of conduct uh, to determine, you know, you know, a gentleman's agreement or a handshake even, really, uh, to make sure that people aren't stealing each other's cattle, right? This is kind of where cattle branding starts to come into place, right? You, you brand your cattle, and again, kind of a, <laughs> a horrifying thing in, in modern terms, but you brand cattle based on, you know, whatever your ranch name is. That way, if someone is accused of stealing a cow, you just look for the brand, and if there is one, you know they're guilty. Um, and in 1873, this fellow Joseph Glidden uh, actually invents barbed wire, okay? And barbed wire fencing is what ends up uh, completely uh, ending the idea of an open range out west, right? People actually begin to put up fencing to prevent cattle from getting away. Um, and the funny thing about Joseph Glidden, the reason why I kind of chuckle every time I see him, 
is if you ever watch Back to the Future 3, okay, there is a, a little scene where um, um, Mary Steenburgen's character is, uh, uh, was it Clara, I think is her name. She's on a, a train leaving whatever town it is they're in in California, going somewhere. Um, and there's a guy uh, who is sitting behind her who is talking about how he's been peddling this barbed wire up and down the West for X number of years or whatever at this point. And it's funny because the guy is Joseph Glidden, <laughs> right? The, it's, it's a nod to an actual historical figure. So it's, it's kind of a, um, an out-of-the-way cameo, I guess. But the guy actually looks like Joseph Glidden. He's got the mutton chops. He's got the glasses. Uh, he's dressed very similarly. So it's, uh, it's kind of funny to see that being put into, um, put into media somehow. And over time, just like what we saw with the robber barons back east and in the industrial sector, um, the cattle industry has its own cattle barons. Okay, so we end up having uh, people who own these gigantic ranches out west and who are basically breeding cattle for no other purpose, again, than to simply sell them at market. Okay, on mass. Okay, so it's just like industrial farming happens. It's industrial um, livestock raising is essentially what it amounts to. And they hire cowboys to come and work for them. Okay, um, you know, the cowboys end up being again kind of the the working class, if you like, out west for that very reason. And again, it's it's just like any other uh, unskilled manual labor position, right? There's all kinds of dangers involved, right? You get uh, you get trampled by a cow, you can get gored, thrown off a horse, snake bit, whatever the case may be, right? There's all kinds of occupational hazards. And Chicago becomes the fastest growing city in the United States after the Civil War ends um, for various reasons. Number one, for the fact that the railroad actually runs directly through the town. And so it becomes kind of this major hub, I guess you could say, for everything moving from the east to the west. Um, and, uh, of course, the, the meatpacking and slaughterhouse industries are really what help put it on the map as well. Okay. Uh, it has uh, several different rivers that all converge in the same area and nine different railroads that end up uh, coming to a junction in, in, call, in Chicago by 1865. Um, and like I said, it's supposed to be kind of this intersection between the east and the west in terms of what they have to offer. So if you're stuck right in the middle of the country, it's nicknamed the heart of the nation for very, um, for very good reason. Right? You can get... Um, stuff that's coming from the East Coast that can land in this area, and you get stuff coming from the West that also lands in this area. So you're, you're essentially getting the best of both worlds, right? It's a very centralized location. And it's got all kinds of stuff in-house. It's got lumber yards, grain elevators, of course the slaughterhouse district and the stockyards uh, are what help put it on the map so much. Um, and uh, meatpacking becomes the biggest in, uh, industry that we see in Chicago and in Cincinnati as well. Okay? Um, pork at this point is actually the more viable option because um, of, the, uh, because of the, uh, the corn more than anything else. Okay? Pork uh, is able to be preserved a little bit longer than beef. It's a little bit easier to preserve. Um, pigs have a, a faster gestation cycle, so if you're trying to breed pigs, they will actually have piglets <laughs> a lot quicker than if uh, a cow has a calf. Okay? Uh, and, of course, like I said, the corn is a big deal, too, because both uh, humans and pigs can eat and digest corn very well. Okay? Cattle are, if you give cows a corn-fed diet, they're not going to be as healthy. Okay? They, they can't digest it very well. And so it's easier to take, you know, corn from these industrial farms in the Midwest, transport it to Chicago, use it to feed humans, use it to feed pigs, and everybody is hunky-dory, right? And by the time we get to 1850, Chicago is producing more than 20,000 uh, hogs on an annual basis, okay? And by the 1870s, it's over 2 million annually, okay? Just because of, again, the sheer number that can be uh, reproduced on, on, a, on a mass scale, and again, it's... Uh, obviously a very controversial thing, right? We're looking at industrial farming and um, industrial uh, livestock raising today, right? There's a lot of uh, legislation and obviously um, uh, ecological concerns, right? Animal rights activists and all that kind of stuff. This is way, way before any of that comes into place. So, um, I mean, you can imagine with the with some of the instances that we see today that have been exposed and, you know, in the news and documentaries and so forth, how much worse the conditions were back then. <laughs>
Um, and the thing that allows uh, meat to actually be transported over such a long, uh, vast you know, area of the United States is the fact, too, that uh, Chicago sits right near Lake Michigan. Okay, so if you get ice from Lake Michigan, which ends up freezing over every single winter, you can actually use that ice, break it down, and pack meat in the ice and put it in a rail car and send it somewhere. Okay, so you can actually begin to transport meat uh, specifically to the East Coast in the wintertime as a direct result of this. If you send it out west during the winter, right, as we know here in Texas, um, we're in the midst of winter right now, and, you know, the weather can get to be in the 60s, 70s, 80s, right, degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, uh, um, there's no guarantee that it's going to keep if you send it out west. That's the point. But over time, we get two gentlemen named Gustavus Swift and Philip Armour, okay, who uh, end up developing refrigerated rail cars. Okay, these are the fellows who actually invent refrigeration. That's how we get refrigerators. Uh, and they allow processed meat to be shipped in summertime as well. So it's not just a seasonal thing, right? If you live out east during this period and you want a steak, you probably have to wait till like January to have one. But now you can get it just about any time of the year. Um, and of course, you can start shipping it out west as well. And over time, Armour and Swift actually becomes a very, um, the, the two men end up actually um, having their corporations combined, and Armour and Swift becomes one of the more famous meatpacking corporations in the United States. Um, it eventually changes hands several times, and I think today it's op operated by somebody overseas. But um, as a direct result, though, I mean, obviously the beef industry just completely explodes, right? People are able to get... Um, beef products uh, in, in different forms any time of the year. And again, the more protein you get, right, the more nutrition you get, um, and the, the better quality of life you get. So there's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a chain reaction, I guess, that happens. And you can argue either way about this, too. I mean, obviously, today not everybody eats meat. <laughs> so there's, there's all kinds of um, margins for error in this kind of logic, but there it is. As we said before, if you are a farmer going out west, uh, you may or may not have a whole lot of success. Okay? Um, between 1870 and 1900, uh, there's 430 million acres of prairie land that's distributed among settlers who are going west of the Mississippi River. Okay? Uh, the Homestead Act is really what begins this. This happens in 1862 and is kind of a, um, the first impetus to try to get people to settle out west. And it's really um, kind of a, a federal government um, tactic to try to settle these areas as uh, potentially free lands before slavery is actually ever abolished, right? To try to kind of smother it from several different angles, okay? And uh, the Homestead Act actually guarantees the land to anybody willing to settle it, but it doesn't give them any kind of equipment or tools or seed or anything like that or livestock of any kind. So if you're going out west, there's not really a starter kit, right? You're doing this from scratch. And as a direct result, two-thirds of all homesteaders who go west actually fail at what they do. So, um, and some of them who do fail, some of them manage to survive, try something else, or turn around and come back, or go to California, or whatever. And uh, a lot of them actually end up uh, starving to death, or succumb to disease, or get attacked by you know, animals, or Native Americans, or whatever the case may be. So, uh, there's, again, it's, it's one of those things where there is no guarantee that you're going to be successful if you do go west. And again, just because they're advertising land, people don't consider the fact that this is a different climate than what the east has. Okay, if you live in the northeast, um, you don't really experience tornadoes very often, right? You might get hailstorms from time to time, but things like droughts, uh, grass fires, uh, blizzards, and so forth, destructive insects that only exist in the Midwest, mosquitoes, and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's all kinds of variables that don't really get put into consideration here. And once people get out west, they realize what they've gotten themselves into uh, quite often too late. Um, and of course, if you are trying to make it as a small farmer on your own in the Midwest, not only do you have all the, the harsh conditions to deal with too, but you also have industrial farming to compete with. So if you're trying to sell anything at market to try to pay off debts of some kind, if you've bought a new steel plow, for instance, um, you might not be able to pay off your debt. Okay, So it, it leads to more economic hardship than, than people might realize. And like I said before, the grassroots that have been there in the Midwest have been there since time began, right? Since the beginning of the earth. 
And so in many cases, the, the grass roots are so thick underground that they end up breaking plows, okay, and breaking steel plows. And so if you have a steel plow, which at this point in time is, you know, the equivalent of, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a harvester machine today, right? It's several thousand dollars in today's, you know, world would be, you know, back in the, in this day, in these days, in the hundreds of dollars, I guess. Uh, if that breaks on you, then you have to go get another one. And if that one breaks, you get another one, right? And so you end up getting into debt because the ground is so destructive to your tools. Um, and of course, too, like I said before, there's no trees really to speak of out in, in the open prairie, right? If you've ever seen any film that happens on the prairie, right, it's, it's nothing but grassland, right? And you can't exactly burn the grass itself for fuel, right? You catch the grass on fire, you're toast. Um, so there's no trees to speak of, there's no coal to mine out of anywhere, there's no hills really. Uh, and so the only means of uh, fuel are, are buffalo chips, right? Buffalo poop that has been hardened and has uh, turned into the, kind of this gigantic pizza-shaped thing <laughs> that you end up having to burn. And of course the, the introdu introduction of the railroad is really kind of a, a saving grace for settlers as well because you can actually get certain products that are delivered to a small community or to a junction somewhere that you can go pick up in your wagon and then take it back to your homestead. Okay, So it's, uh, it's beneficial for white settlers and for, for settlers in general, but if you are a Native American or if you are an animal, of course a wild animal living out west, um, you're potentially a target in all this. Okay, it's it's destructive to what exists and beneficial for what ends up arriving. Um, most of the houses that are built in this in these particular areas, again, there's no wood really to harvest, so you have to actually bring lumber from back east um, to these particular areas to actually build a house. Right, if you're thinking of little house in the prairie and then building a log cabin, okay. You have to ask yourself where they got the logs from. Okay, um, they might be able to if you settle near a, a forest or something, you can make do. But um, but uh, it's it's not always guaranteed. And James Oliver is the guy who invents what's called the sodbuster plow. And the sodbuster is kind of like what we see uh, up here in the in the top right. It's a, a steel blade that's kind of at a uh, a, a point at the bottom, like the prow of a ship, right? You have two blades that are meeting in kind of a triangle here, excuse me, at the base, um, and this creates a, a direct trench in the ground as you drag it behind an animal. Uh, and again, this helps with labor requirements, right? In other words, you don't have somebody who's coming along uh, with a garden hoe and doing it all by hand, doing back-breaking work, and you, you would have to do this for, for gigantic amounts of acres in order to be able to make any kind of profit because it's so uh, cheap to sell it for, you know, however much per pound it actually sells for, okay? Um, but again, these pieces of equipment are so expensive that uh, if, uh, in order to get one, in order to be able to work the land, you have to be able to pay an astronomical price. And so you get in debt. If the thing breaks, you have to go buy another one. So it's... Um, there's all kinds of ways of basically burying yourself in debt in the process. And we talked about bonanza farms already in chapter 17. Right? Bonanza is a word that just means a fortune of some kind. Okay? And so these bonanza farms start to extend more and more into the Midwest and even out further west. Okay? Initially, they land in places like Ohio, but over time we start to see them pop up in Minnesota, up north, in the Dakotas, and even out west in California in some cases. So it's uh, no matter where you're settling, if you're a farmer and you're trying to do subsistence farming for yourself and your family and sell you know whatever surplus you have at market there's no guarantee that no matter where you settle you're not going to run into industrial farming as well and wheat becomes kind of the primary cash crop during this period as well but the the difference between wheat and the other cash crops is that wheat itself is consumable right you can process it turn it into flour turn it into grain cereal and that kind of thing you can process it in a certain way whereas uh, you know, cotton and, and tobacco, you can't really eat it. <laughs> so, um, so industrialized farming becomes more and more prevalent in the Midwest, primarily for that reason. And same thing with corn as well. But um, again, if you are a small farmer uh, and you run into one of these industrial farmers who is setting up shop out west, you're probably going to be put out of work pretty soon and you have to pack up and move elsewhere. 
So um, this is part of the reason why the West is settled so much and why people migrate so much out West is because in many instances they're quite simply pushed out of the way by big business. So it's, it's a, a matter of necessity more so than any kind of uh, sense of adventure or a desire to destroy other cultures, even though that does happen along the way. And the presence of women is something that um, doesn't really get discussed a whole lot about the West, primarily because women don't really uh, have that much of a presence, at least as single women uh, out West. Okay? If you are a woman out West, chances are you have come with uh, your family. right? If you, if you come with your husband, if you come with your parents, right? that is probably the only real situation where you are a single woman. If you're migrating, you're typically migrating with a group. Okay. And the ratio of men to women in most mining towns is 9 to 1. Okay. So if you are a woman uh, in a mining town and you are single, right, statistically speaking, you are probably a prostitute. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily a, a good or safe thing to be a single woman trying to, um, to live in a, in a mining town by yourself. Okay. In a boom town like Tombstone, right, you have only a couple of options, really. Marry someone quickly or go join a local brothel. Okay, so it's uh, again, it's it's not uh, uh, not a good thing, obviously, right? If there, there's no safe option, really, um, and of course, women are still not given a whole lot of rights at this point, right? They're still stuck into these positions as a spouse, a housekeeper, a farming assistant, if they are, if they get attached to uh, a man or family or something like that. This is really the only capacity that they have. Okay, and if you are a single woman who is working on your own you typically will have to attach yourself to a family somewhere simply for safety reasons. Uh, again, because um, very few people um, are able to make it on their own out west uh, for, for any number of reasons. By 1900, about 98% of women living in Nebraska are married <laughs> for, for obvious reasons. Again, because um, you, know, you have to attach yourself to a large group of some kind um, to, to be able to accrue money of any kind because there, there really is no, um, no industry really to speak of. There's no availability for a woman to work as a typist or a clerk or, what, or a librarian or a teacher or anything even. Sometimes an unmarried woman might work as a teacher out west if a small community has a schoolhouse of some kind, but um, even then it's kind of a rarity. Um, and again, this, this system is extremely patriarchal, it's extremely chauvinistic. Okay? Women are not allowed to buy or sell property without the approval of their husband, okay, if they are married. Uh, in Texas at this point in time, women are only allowed to sue if they're suing for divorce. Okay? So if you're, um, you know, if you're trying to sue uh, your neighbor for doing something, right, if you have to let your husband do it. Right? It's, it's just the, the system that's in place. Uh, they're not allowed to serve on juries, act as lawyers, or witness wills. Right. So if you're if you're trying to act as like a power of attorney or something, you don't have that option. Okay. So it's a, uh, um, and these types of rights are something that don't really start to accumulate uh, until much much later in the 19th century, and really in many cases not until the 20th century. Again, universal suffrage in the United States doesn't happen until 1920 for women. Right. We're just now at the hundredth anniversary of it. Um, but over time, some of these things start to kind of fall like little dominoes over, you know, over the course of a, a decade or two. Um, and the other thing, too, that people don't really realize is that if you are a woman attached to a husband, attached to a father or whoever, if that individual is your, your anchor or your quote-unquote safety somehow, again, it's, it's, it's hard for us to, to consider that in, in that chauvinistic way, but... Um, if you are, if you, if your husband or your father or whoever it is that you're attached to, if that individual gets hurt or killed through a farming accident, if they get accidentally dragged under a plow somehow, if they uh, fall uh, fall prey to disease or to an animal attack, an Indian attack, um, quite often women are left to their own devices. Okay, and if you live out west in the middle of nowhere, right, and someone gets killed or harmed or whatever, you have to make do with what you got. Um, the only early instance I can think of, at least in Hollywood terms, where this is portrayed is uh, the film Old Yeller. Okay? The, the woman who lives on the farm is really, uh, the mother is really kind of operating as a single parent, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think that the husband ever shows. I think he's actually killed early on before the movie ever begins. And she's got two kids. She's got to make everything work and all that. 
So, um, so it's, it's a really harsh reality. Uh, so self-reliance and independence are extremely important um, things to actually develop. Um, 1890 is when we finally see a milestone begin to occur out of necessity and out of uh, greater respect, I'd like to think anyway, for women because Wyoming becomes the first state to allow women to vote in all elections. Okay? Uh, and this is, a again, it's a really big deal because Wyoming is so heavily separated from the rest of the country, right? It's fairly isolated. Uh, even today, it seems isolated. Um, and one particular lady who is a, another little case study from this time period, um, and especially when it comes to, to black women living out west too, right? There's, there's still an even further separation from, um, from the mainstream in terms of being able to um, you know, be accepted as an independent member of society without being attached to a man. Um, you want to see a lady who actually challenges this is uh, Mary Fields. She's nicknamed Stagecoach Mary, okay? And she's a, the first African-American star root mail carrier. She actually is depicted here in the background. Um, she, you know, would actually ride in this carriage from town to town delivering the mail. And as you can imagine, that in and of itself is a dangerous thing, right? You might have people sending money in the mail. You can get hijacked by, by bandits. You can be attacked by Native Americans, by animals, whatever the case may be. And she's a tough lady. Uh, she uh, smoked cigars on a regular basis. She drank whiskey. Uh, she swore on a regular basis in conversation, and she carried a gun with her all the time, okay? So, um, you know, not a lady that you want to cross, not a lady that you want to, to mess with, right? So, you know, people, uh, people tend to underestimate and overlook these types of situations, right? The West is not just cowboys, you know, fighting each other and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Women had a very real and very prominent presence um, uh, in terms of, you know, what they're able to accomplish. And again, it gets overlooked far too often. As it relates to Native Americans, now that we've kind of discussed them as kind of a background presence in all this, now they come to the forefront. Okay? Um, it's estimated that up until this point, right, we've had somewhere in the neighborhood of about a quarter of a million Native Americans who have been displaced by settlers east of the Mississippi River. Okay? We've already seen the Indian Removal Act uh, with uh, Andrew Jackson in the 1830s, um, and so now we're starting to see Western settlers come into much more direct conflict with Native Americans who have already been displaced, right, and who already are nursing grudges, as you can imagine. Um, by 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty ends up defining um, tribal borders at this point, and tribal borders were kind of an unspoken um, agreement, really, among tribes up until this point because there wasn't really a presence of white settlers infringing upon those areas, okay? There was a traditional landmark boundary of some kind that everybody respected, and they only disrespected it if they were going to war with one another or, you know, staging a raid or whatever the case may be. Uh, and so basically, this is not so much for the benefit of Native Americans, this treaty, but it's for the benefit of whites, okay? So now a white person can have a map of some kind where they can draw a boundary and say, okay, this is Cheyenne territory, this is Arapaho territory, this is Kiowa territory. If we go into this territory, these people are friendly, they might trade with us, these people will kill us, okay? So it's kind of a, a weird little, um, almost like a safety map of some kind for white settlers. Um, and as you can imagine, this is not a, a, a fail-safe of any kind. This is not a foolproof uh, option. Okay, So border disputes happen all the time, and in many cases the borders are actually set up by, um, by white legislators. Okay, That's not really the, the natives themselves don't always have a say in where their tribal borders are defined. Okay, Their traditional borders that they might have had might have been twice the size of what they used to be, Okay, but because uh, or might be twice as small as what they used to be. And now that there are more settlers pushing the tribes out west, right, the tribal lands are shrinking as a direct result. Okay? And so, again, there's, a, uh, there's not even uh, a guarantee that white settlers are going to abide by this. Okay? In many cases, they will completely infringe upon these territories anyway and get themselves killed or, or something along those lines, or kill Native Americans. The period in the 1860s to 1870s is known as the period of the Indian Wars uh, across the western portion of the United States. 
um, and called Indian Wars for very obvious reasons because we now have several intertribal conflicts now that their lands are becoming smaller. There's all kinds of conflicts that arise there, and also Native Americans um, uh, fighting with the federal government. Right? We have the U.S. cavalry uh, beginning to attack Native American tribes out west. Uh, and so we see uh, tons and tons of conflict with and going in multiple directions. It's extremely chaotic. Um, and the key feature of the federal government during this period is that it makes a lot of promises that get broken very quickly. Okay? It promises to sign multiple treaties with multiple tribes, guaranteeing that uh, lands are going to be granted to Native Americans in perpetuity. In other words, they can stay on these lands forever. We'll never take them away from you, we promise and then it turns around and gets changed a year or two later. Um, and not just is it violated by the government, right? We have plenty of hunters, miners, ranchers, settlers, farmers, and soldiers who end up violating these acts all the time. And the lines have to be redrawn, people have to sign another treaty, and as you can imagine, the Native Americans are sick of this. They're, they're sick of their um, their lands being taken from them, and the Native Americans themselves don't have the same concept of uh, of land ownership that white settlers do either. White settlers believe that they have some kind of right to own the land itself, but the Native Americans believe that they belong to the land. Okay, and so the the land is not theirs really to 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 sell or distribute or anything like that. Um, one particular Sioux chief named Spotted Tail makes the joke that the president should start putting natives on wheels because they move them around so much. Okay. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a rueful joke, right? He's, he's, you know, saying this in a sad way, but um, it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality. He's not wrong. Um, and the, the purpose of the U.S. Army during and before the Civil War is, is very different from what it is now, okay? Uh, before the Civil War, the U.S. Army had a very small presence out west, and it was really there to ensure that uh, settlers were protected from Indian attacks of some kind, right? It was more of a ostensibly defensive thing, okay? After the war, though, the army is being much more aggressive and much more um, proactive, I guess, about taking Native Americans and making sure that they stay on reservation lands, okay? Making sure that they don't infringe upon the, the, the quote-unquote rights of white settlers, okay? They don't police the white settlers so much, right? They don't punish them if they end up going onto Native lands, but the opposite is true. And by 1862, uh, instances like the Sioux Uprising that occurs in the Minnesota Valley um, become pretty commonplace. Uh, the Sioux kill 644 whites uh, for infringing on their lands, uh, for, for breaking promises and, and you know, you know, destroying the land and doing all kinds of stuff. The Sand Creek Massacre is another much more infamous um, situation that occurs because it has repercussions that extend to, to whites in particular. Um, the governor of Colorado is a guy named John Evans during this period. You see him here. Uh, he says that after a white family from Denver is massacred by a certain Native American tribe, he tells the, the residents of the state that they need to um, rise up and basically kill Native Americans whenever they find them, right? He says, you know, they've, uh, you know, they've, they've violated uh, our way of doing things by killing us, and so we suddenly seem to have the right to kill them. At least that's his logic in this. Revenge, essentially. And he promises that if there are any friendly natives, quote-unquote friendly natives, right, specifically Arapaho and Cheyenne tribesmen who want to actually come to certain forts and, um, you know, be protected from these other particular tribes that he believes are responsible, they can come, they can surrender, and, you know, we'll protect you, okay? Um, instead, what happens is um, a, a local army colonel named John Chivington here takes 700 militiamen and end up attacking an Arapaho and Cheyenne camp at Sand Creek, okay, uh, in Colorado. And this turns into the massacre, right, that we're talking about. Again, this is the federal government directly breaking its promise, right, luring people into the idea that, you know, they're going to be safe, right, that they're going to be protected if they surrender, but instead they're attacked and killed in the process. Um, and we end up with 165 men, women, and children who are uh, not only killed, but are actually scalped and mutilated, okay, and the, the scalping thing that uh, gets tossed around so much as part of, 
you know, the, the traditional, you know, uh, relatively stereotypical and racist cowboys and Indians scenario, okay, um, scalping is not necessarily something that is uh, perpetuated by Native American tribes. It's actually white settlers who do it more than anything else. Uh, it becomes a stereotypical thing during this period and is perpetuated so much by whites that they actually start to pass it off as something that Native Americans do somehow. No one ever really sees them do it, but we're going to spread this horror story enough and we use it as a scare tactic for people. Okay, It's kind of like if a you know the what a, a mother might tell a child to keep the child behaving if you if you don't behave and don't eat your vegetables or whatever the indians are going to come and scalp you and again it's a it's a horribly stereotypical and racist uh, approach to things but in this particular case this is one example where we can actually see white uh, whites doing this instead so the white soldiers actually are the ones who end up scalping and mutilating people over the course of 7 hours okay this is not a, a short thing that occurs, right? They don't just shoot everybody and leave, right? They, they torture them. And Chivington instead claims that he has, uh, he goes and he tells the governor that he's actually killed a thousand entrenched hostile natives, okay? And again, these were not hostile people, and there certainly were not a thousand of them, right? He has massacred a small, uh, not a small, but 165 people in, in response to what the governor said. And in response, um, Chivington's captain, a guy named Silas Sewell, who you also see here in the background, he's kneeling here in the, in the forefront on the right side, um, he refuses to take part in the massacre because he knows what Chivington is doing. He knows Chivington is lying. He knows he's going to tell a different story. And instead, he comes out and tells the truth about what happens. He says that Chivington has killed all these people, that he has um, you know, broken promises and has betrayed the trust of everybody. Um, and Chivington is actually uh, eventually, uh, can, you know, resigns as a result. He knows that if he goes to trial, he's going to be convicted, perhaps. Um, again, they, they might end, end up coming down on his side anyway, but to avoid prosecution, he does that. He ends up becoming the, the sheriff for Denver uh, and actually becomes a local celebrity. He goes to, to dinners and actually recounts the tale to people, right? Uh, they treat him like, uh, you know, again, like some kind of celebrity for it. And the most tragic thing in all this is the fact that one of Chivington's other men ends up murdering Silas Sewell um, a, a, a few years later, okay, because of all this. So, And this is not supposed to be 1865, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be 1895. So, um, uh, so Chivington doesn't really have much of a life after that. He's a, he's a hunted man, and um, they, they basically just punish him for telling the truth. Um, and the U.S. Army starts to recruit people right and left in, in all this in response to the, the following Indian attacks. And, of course, Native Americans begin to attack whites more prevalently after this. Uh, it, it proves the point of, of, of the governor here. It's, right, it's kind of abating people into attacking us by massacring innocent people. Right? We're, we're justifying our actions now. And so you start hearing terms like whitewashed rebels, right? These are people who are former Confederate soldiers who might still be alive, right, 30 years now after the war has ended, who decide instead that they're going to go join the U.S. Army, right, the, the former Union Army, and they're going to go fight Indians out west, okay, just because they want to kill Indians. So, again, the U.S. Army at this point is not really a scrupulous entity either, <laughs> nothing really positive to speak of necessarily. There's plenty of African American cavalry regiments uh, too, right? We we set a precedent with this during the Civil War, to where African Americans can be a part of this. Um, and the Buffalo Soldiers, as they're nicknamed, is one particular regiment that actually wins 18 Congressional Medals of Honor uh, in the process of their service, right? 18 different members um, are are part of this. So, um, and again, you know, whatever the the circumstances for each one of those situations, right? For, for better or for worse, if it involves the killing of Native Americans, you know, again, take from it what you will. The relocation of Native Americans, again, we've already established as a, a commonplace thing by now. Okay? Uh, two years after the war ends is when Congress actually starts to examine the situation out west, and it, uh, it submits what it calls the Report on the Condition of the Indian Tribes, and creates the, the Indian Peace Commission to try to bring a stop to the Indian Wars, because these have actually been going on uh, even before the Civil War really occurs, right? There's not much of a, 
um, a national prevalence to it until after the war occurs because more people start moving west. But again, during this point in time, people start to pay more attention to it. Um, and again, it moves Native Americans onto more condensed forms of land and specifically onto federal reservations to quote unquote civilize them, okay? Basically to force them to assimilate into white European culture. Okay. And, of course, reservations still exist today, and they are extremely dilapidated areas in many regards. Um, the Native Americans who still live there, who are several generations removed now, uh, have been kind of pigeonholed into a very, um, you know, I won't call it uh, servile or subservient form of uh, culture, but they're, they've been very heavily suppressed, and there's a lot of economic... Um, disadvantages that go on there, right? There's a lot of, um, lot, lot of issues, a lot of social and economic issues that occur. Um, 1870, the natives in the Dakota Territory outnumber whites two to one, and a decade later, whites outnumber natives six to one. So this outnumbering is not only reversed, but dramatically expanded. The conference at Medicine Lodge, Kansas, I think is what you see here in the background, um, where we have Kiowa, Comanche, Arapaho, and Cheyenne natives who meet with the federal government representatives and agree to relocate to western Oklahoma, which is where many of the Native American tribes still exist on kind of this combined um, reservation even today. And the Treaty of Fort Laramie is another one. This might even be the one that I see in the background here, um, where the Lakota Sioux actually agreed to settle in the Black Hills Reservation in the Dakota Territory up north. Okay? And the Treaty of Fort Laramie is one that ends up getting um, violated probably the most prevalently and the most famously in a, a particular event that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, one thing that is to the credit of Ulysses S. Grant during this period, backing up a little bit into the, the president's at, at play here, one of the only things that Grant uh, proposed that could have you know, given him perhaps a better reputation over time is that he actually is one of the only presidents, in fact maybe the only president that we have during this period, who calls for Native Americans to be granted peaceful citizenship. Okay, and remember, uh, this is constantly denied to them in the 14th Amendment, uh, into the Civil Rights Acts of, of the 1860s and 1870s. They're constantly told that they cannot be citizens. Okay? Um, and they're not granted full citizenship, again, until 1924. Okay? So Grant had this one particular idea that could have been put to fruition if people in the United States had a better um, image of what they believed Native Americans to be. So it, it's another missed opportunity. Um, General Philip Sheridan, who is a kind of an underling to William Tecumseh Sherman, the guy who was famous during the Civil War as a Union general, uh, tells Sheridan to kill hostile uh, Native American warriors out west uh, basically with abandon, right? Anybody who is a Cheyenne, Arapaho, or Kiowa uh, warrior who tries to basically stop the U.S. government from, from showing up, right, you have the freedom to kill them at will. Okay, so this uh, it creates kind of this mercenary culture among U.S. Uh, Army soldiers where people become essentially um, Indian fighters, right? The, the certain regiments are specifically designated as Indian fighters and Indian killers. And anyone who is considered a quote-unquote non-hostile native, we've already seen the fate of them before, right? If they allow themselves to be considered non-hostile, they will be forced onto reservations, again, which are poorly supplied, right? The, the government doesn't really give a whole lot of um, care of any kind to these particular areas. And the Red River War is something a little closer to home for those of us who live here in Texas, right? This is a situation in um, the mid-1870s where Sheridan soldiers uh, fight against the Comanche, the Cheyenne, the Kiowa, and the Arapaho all along the Red River between Texas and Oklahoma. Okay, and so there's a constant pitch battle on just about all sides of the, of the river in all this. The most famous situation that you see, of course, is um, between Custer and the Lakota Sioux. Okay? And the, the image you see here in the background before I even go into bringing up text, um, these are bones that are piled up or were piled up in the, in the days following the massacre. These bones have been picked clean by uh, wild animals, coyotes and wolves and all that kind of stuff. 
But these are the bones not only of, of humans, but of horses as well, okay, that are all just kind of piled up. Uh, and as you can see, they're picked totally clean. I think this, was, this photograph was taken maybe about a week after the massacre occurred. Um, the entire conflict between Custer and the Sioux and what actually ends up ensuing after the fact is that um, we have a lot of white prospectors who continue to violate federal law by going onto Sioux lands up in the north. Okay. And in particular, um, the as we already established, the Lakota Sioux have settled into the Black Hills territory in the Dakotas. Okay, and the Sioux are are uh, particularly um, managed and overseen by uh, two chieftains named Sitting Bull and Red Cloud. Right, Sitting Bull, of course, is one of the most famous Native Americans uh, of all time. Right, he's the probably the most photographed um, Native American. And then Red Cloud is one of his uh, contemporaries as well. And the two of them vow that they are going to resist any further settlement in their territory because, again, like many other Native American tribes, they're simply tired of whites breaking their promises. This is when Custer steps in, and uh, George Armstrong Custer is a lieutenant governor or lieutenant colonel, I beg your pardon, in the in the U.S. Army, and he's in charge of the Seventh Cavalry. He leads his group into the Black Hills again, violating federal law, and discovers gold in the area. And we've already seen what happens when gold is discovered anywhere, right? People are already beginning to feel starved for gold now that we are, you know, about 30 years or so uh, separated from the gold rush in California, right? People are going to uh, amass themselves in these particular areas. And so the government tries to purchase the Black Hills territory from Sitting Bull, who is kind of the, the primary chief in all these tribes and he specifically says no he's like we've we've done enough we're not interested in the gold that's not the point he says the point is that we we are tired of moving we're tired of you exercising greed here and uh, and trying to move us away from all this and so the government gives its blessing to Custer to force the Sioux onto reservations and kill anybody who decides that they want to resist okay and that's exactly what ends up happening uh, the Great Sioux War ensues in 1875 and 1876, uh, and it lasts, uh, it spreads itself out across several different states, right? Right in that particular area, right? South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and even as far south as Nebraska. And of course, the culmination in all this and the most famous pitched battle between Native Americans and the U.S. Army is the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Okay, and this occurs in June of 1876. Um, Custer launches a surprise attack against a combined camp of Sioux, Arapaho, and Cheyenne on the Little Bighorn River. Um, and uh, Sioux warriors themselves are led by uh, Crazy Horse, uh, a very, very famous Sioux warrior. Uh, and Crazy Horse, uh, just as a side note, we don't actually have any photographs of Crazy Horse. Uh, he was actually um, said to have been uh, a little bit different in appearance from many natives of the time. He had lighter skin, uh, actually had dark and curlier hair than, than Native Americans did uh, at the time, but Crazy Horse was known as being a, an extremely um, violent and very, uh, you know, very aggressive leader and very successful leader, actually, as a, a military leader for the, for the natives. And so he actually leads a group into uh, into the fray, right, now that the now that Custer has attacked this camp, I think he attacks at dawn, Crazy Horse comes in and massacres all 210 of the soldiers, okay, including Custer. And uh, it just turns into a gigantic rout for the for the U.S. Army. It's something that they don't anticipate happening, right? They, they don't anticipate losing here. Um, and Grant uh, starts to panic. He orders more troops to come in and actually go so far as to abandon his quote-unquote peace policy and all this. Like, like the U.S. Army was ever really peaceful right now. Um, so the, he's basically saying take no prisoners. We're not trying to force them under reservations. We're trying to exterminate them now. Um, and by 1876, it, uh, the, the Sioux end up getting worn down so much by soldiers with guns uh, and, and so forth. They end up basically going back on their uh, original agreement and say that they're going to agree to sell the, the Black Hills to the government after all. Um, Crazy Horse ends up surrendering in 1877 uh, and is, uh, is murdered by a guard who essentially doesn't like him. It's, it ends up being just kind of a, a situation. I think the guard steps up behind him when he's leading him either to or from a cell and um, 
I think he trips him up and shoots him or something along those lines. He, he shoots him, I do know that. Um, and Sitting Bull and many other um, chiefs, I know Sitting Bull in particular is, is put on a reservation and kind of put into this forced imprisonment of, of a sort. Red Cloud, I can't remember if he dies in battle or if he actually is uh, put on a reservation as well. But by 1880, um, the, the Indian Wars have virtually come to an end, and we're in the, the point now where most natives are living on reservations. As it relates to the buffalo, uh, again, this is another very uh, sad downturn that we see here. In the background, it's, it's kind of difficult to tell, but this gigantic pile or piles that you see here are buffalo hides. Um, and you see the, the, the man sitting on top of, of the mound up here at the top left, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, I mean, this is a pile of buffalo hides stacked probably about 12 feet high, um, uh, you know, behind the banner here that you see. Um, in the 1750s, the general estimate is that there's about 30 million buffalo in the Great Plains. Okay, this is before Western settlers really begin to even establish um, solid footholds in the, the Western continent. And by 1850, there's fewer than 10 million. Okay, by 1900, though, there's only a few hundred. Okay, that sharp of a drop um, is directly um, uh, as a result of what you see here in the background. Okay. Um, another instance here in this particular photograph is also extremely haunting to me. Uh, this is a mountain of buffalo skulls that you see. Okay, and again, you see two men here, one at the bottom and one at the top to give you a sense of scale. Okay, and the man on the bottom seems relatively proud of himself. Um, but after the Civil War, there becomes a gigantic boom in buffalo hunting uh, for, for commercial reasons. Again, buffalo hides can be turned around and made into coats. They can be made into hats. Um, buffalo skulls become decorative. Um, buffalo meat becomes lucrative as well, um, so it's uh, it's it becomes such a, a, a commercial commodity during this period that um, buffalo were virtually hunted to extinction, and it's only by virtue of a few uh, livestock herders who managed to take a few and actually begin to raise them and continue them uh, on on private lands that they even exist at all today. Um, and the railroad itself is largely to blame for this. Again, most of the, the grazing territory where buffalo existed is now taken over by the railroad. Um, the land is, itself has been destroyed by the railroad industry. The noise has scared them away. Uh, and, of course, white hunters have come and have killed many of them. Okay, so, uh, and in many instances, right, it's not even so much the, 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 the usefulness, the actual practical application of, of leather and, and buffalo hides, but some of hunters simply want them as trophies or simply someone who's wealthy enough to purchase one, okay, for no other reason than as an ornament. It's estimated that about 100 are killed every single day, though. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, if you ever watch the, the film Dances with Wolves, and it's got its own issues in terms of being, you know, um, <laughs> uh, white privilege and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's a whole, that's a whole other topic. But um, one particular scene that's extremely devastating shows uh, where the, the Lakota Sioux actually walk onto a, a gigantic swath of prairie where they have been following buffalo for days to decide where they're going to settle. And they come over the top of a hill and see, uh, stretching as far as they can see, um, dead and rotting buffalo carcasses that have been skinned. Okay, so it's a, it's a situation where um, the, the white hunters are simply there for the buffalo hides, uh, and uh, Kevin Costner is narrating. He says, for their hides and for their tongues, okay, uh, as, as some kind of a trophy. Okay, so there's no, um, there's no purpose in, in uh, any kind of usefulness for them aside from that, right? They don't use uh, they don't use the meat. They don't use anything like that. And Native American tribes, like the Sioux, used every single part of the animal somehow, right? They use the horns and the the head pieces of it for for you know for religious ceremonies and rituals. Um, they of course use the hides for protection. They use the meat to eat it, um, and they use every part of the animal for tanning. They use it for for all kinds of stuff. So it's a it's a gigantic step in the wrong direction in terms of waste, okay? and, and it's, a, uh, it's something that cannot be overstated in terms of how devastating it is. Um, one thing in particular that your book states, and I don't know how much I really necessarily agree with this, right? and it could just be you know, a one-sided way of looking at it, but your book insinuates that natives themselves could have potentially hunted the buffalo to extinction on their own. Uh, and again, I don't know how much I agree with that just because of the um, 
the the ethical and philosophical approach that most natives took to hunting buffalo during this period. But um, now that natives have been given guns by by Western settlers or have taken guns, right, whether they've traded them or, or raided and taken them, uh, and they've had access to horses since the Spaniards left them there in the 1700s. Okay, so both of those. Uh, introductions of European tools, I guess you could say, uh, could have caused a greater downturn of the buffalo, but I don't think that Native Americans on their own would have hunted them to extinction. I think whites have a lot to do with that. Um, but again, your book claims that um, a lack of white presence out west might have extended the buffalo's lifespan in the west by another 30 years. Again, I, I have to disagree with that, quite frankly. Um, when it comes to drought, uh, there is also another problem here too. Okay? Between the 1880s and 1890s, the West itself experiences a prolonged drought that ends up drying up a lot of the grasslands. Um, and this is part of the, uh, I guess, just nature itself intervening in this process because it also creates uh, a lot of uh, um, starvation for these animals. So. Uh, even if they weren't killed by white hunters, many of them probably would have died from starvation uh, somewhere along the line or dehydration or whatever the case may be, but um, uh, certainly it put them at a disadvantage for, for hunters to come in. Um, and the other problem too is because of the horses, because not only of native horses, but also of uh, European settlers and their livestock, okay, the, the cattle that end up settling in many areas of the Midwest. Um, there's over two million imported horses now in the United States on the prairie that are eating the grass that buffalo would have eaten before. Okay, so lots of contributing factors. It's not necessarily one thing or another, but, um, uh, but in terms of greed and so forth, you can blame white settlers in many instances for this. And another heartbreaking photo here that you can see in the background is, uh, is again, something that um, becomes a real reality for Native Americans um, after the 1880s. Okay? And these are all Native American children who have uh, essentially had their culture completely stripped from them. Okay? These were children who would have grown up um, wearing the traditional garb of their tribe and have now been completely um, uh, Europeanized, I guess is the best way to put it. Okay, they've, they've, been, they've been dressed in European clothing. Many of them have been uh, baptized, quite often forcibly baptized, into the Christian faith. They've had their hair cut, right? Many of the boys would have had hair longer than the girls that you see in the front here. And most of them have you know, hair that's been cut extremely short. And they've had their hair shaved in some cases. Um, and they've been even renamed, right? A lot of these children would have had traditional native names in their own native language, and now they have been given um, Christian names upon baptism. So, um, you know, this is the, the new reality, unfortunately. Uh, this picture was taken in 1890, you can see up here. This is a, uh, an industrial school uh, somewhere in the Midwest. Um, and the, the migration of native tribes into areas where they're finally settling uh, ends up uh, you know, happening all throughout this time period. Okay, so you have uh, specific tribes like the Crow and the Blackfeet natives leaving Montana altogether. Um, the Modoc tribe leaves the California Oregon borderlands, right? They were nestled kind of up in the woods there for a long time. Um, the Utes now give up most of their land in western Colorado, even though there is kind of a small contingency, I think, that still lives there on a reservation today. Uh, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce is one particular um, individual who has kind of a, um, you know, a sad story from this time period because he attempts as much as he can to lead a small group of natives out of the United States altogether to get away from the army uh, and to lead them up into Canada. Uh, but along the line, he and his group are actually captured by the army. And uh, they're eventually located to what is just lumped in as the quote-unquote Indian territory in Oklahoma today, but um, I mean you can see in his face in this particular image, this was taken after he was captured, the sadness in his eyes. Uh, the, he gives a very famous and eloquent speech during this period in which he, he says quite literally, I'm tired. He says, I'm tired of fighting back against people who you know, simply want what they want. Uh, and are willing to do whatever it takes to get it. He says, we are not willing to do whatever it takes to, um, to try to fight them back as much as, as they want this. They want this more than we want to get away from them. Uh, and so it's a, a really sad situation of defeat that ends up occurring here.
and some people are much more hostile in their response to this. Um, Geronimo, who is of course the one of the more famous uh, natives who also fights back along the same lines as Sitting Bull. Okay, he's a Chiricahua Apache uh, native who lives kind of in the southwest portion of the United States. Um, he goes into a 15-year rebellion, uh, launches a rebellion among the Apache against whites, and will raid their camps in the night, uh, slit throats, right, raid them and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and he's f eventually captured, and I think he's killed uh, along the line or at some point too. But um, well, he lasts until 1909, so he might have he might have lived a little bit longer. The situation involving the ghost dance is another kind of tragic after effect that we see happening uh, among reservation culture. Um, by the time we get to 1888, again, many native tribes have been on reservations for a long time already. Uh, and a Paiute native that we have here named Wavoka, his name is Christianized name is Jack Wilson, but Wavoka falls into a, a, a delirium after he catches a fever during this period, and a fever is potentially lethal during this time. Again, there's no real medicine to, to combat this. And so when he actually awakens from it, he views it as being a kind of spiritual journey, and he has a, a vision in the course of all this. And his vision is something that spreads like wildfire among natives living on reservations because it involves um, the, the instruction of the spirit realm to him of something called the ghost dance. Okay? And the ghost dance is this ceremony that is supposed to somehow invoke the, um, the presence of a Native American redeemer of sorts, kind of a, uh, I mean, in, in Western European culture, something like a Christ-like figure who is somehow going to appear and help natives get out of this situation, okay? Um, and, you know, again, take from it what you will. This may just simply be as simple as, um, you know, something, a, a, a last bastion of hope, right, in the midst of a, a horrifying situation, okay? But uh, regardless, the, the vision that Wavoka has is of wearing a particular type of tunic um, where if you, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, I may be confusing this with something else, but um, a, a particular tunic with a type of design on it that would prevent uh, white bullets from, from penetrating them. Uh, and if you perform the ghost dance, this is going to somehow uh, prevent you from being harmed by whites. Okay? It's, it's going to create some kind of spiritual barrier in that regard. Okay? Um, by 1890, though, a couple of years later after this happens, the ghost dance becomes so, prim so prominent on uh, local reservations that whites suddenly start to realize what it is they're doing, and they uh, recognize it as a form of subversion. This is like a, a, a protest of some kind, and they start to uh, punish people who are doing it. Um, and this is what leads to the death of Sitting Bull. Okay, Sitting Bull... Uh, takes part in this, and Sitting Bull himself is actually a medicine man who uh, serves in part as a medicine man and in part as a chief. But uh, he is actually killed by reservation police when he refuses to stop doing the ghost dance. Um, the police actually end up shooting him. Um, and not too long thereafter, in fact just uh, about two weeks later, uh, we have another very famous massacre that occurs at Wounded Knee. Uh, and this occurs when uh, white soldiers come in and perform another massacre. They kill 200 native men, women, and children who are attempting to surrender. Um, and all this put together is actually something that um, people are finally, whites are finally starting to get a sense that um, what's happening to Native Americans is, uh, is not exactly above board, right? Not everybody is actually approving of the federal government's um, actions here, okay? And this doesn't really get the, the kind of attention that it deserves during the time period, and it really takes nearly a hundred years before people begin to advocate more for Native American rights. One very early example of this during the time period, and you know, question her motives however you will, but a lady named Helen Hunt Jackson writes a book called A Century of Dishonor, okay, in which she actually details the specific cruelties uh, that, um, that, the, that the government and that European settlers have inflicted on Native Americans. She only she dies only four years later, uh, as you can tell by the the dates. But uh, she but this is a book that's largely forgotten during this period because people still have this stereotypical mindset of what Native Americans are. And even on into the the twentieth century in the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties, anytime there's a uh, a Western movie, right? It's typically Indians who are the bad guys. 
Um, a piece of legislation that's passed during this time as well is done by a Massachusetts senator named Henry Dawes. Okay? He produces what's called the Dawes Severalty Act, which basically divides up tribal lands and starts to allot them to individuals. Right? He basically takes all the tribal lands that were um, initially assigned to Native Americans and gives them to white settlers instead. Okay? So this is a kind of, again, adding more insult to injury. Uh, more than anything else, but he grants 160 acres to each family head. Okay, and 160 acres is a lot, a uh, lot of land. Um, and uh, today, for individuals who are looking to, um, you know, discover whether or not they have Native American ancestry, the the primary way of doing this, or one of the primary ways, is to look on what's called the Dawes Rolls. Uh, and Dawes Roll is basically a um, a list of natives who were um, cataloged in the censuses of the time period and for people to trace their ancestry back to. So it's, it's one of the ways that individuals um, try to prove their ancestry and uh, in some cases it allows them to be granted tribal membership, right? Again, for better or for worse, right? There's all kinds of modern controversy surrounding this as well. Uh, you know, another way of potentially exploiting something. Um, Satanta is another individual from this period who is kind of like Geronimo, kind of like Sitting Bull. He fights back a lot. Um, his name just means white bear. Uh, we don't have a birth date for him, but he died in 1878. And he specifically tries to make a, um, tries to entreat the federal government not to keep people on reservations, to say that, you know, natives need to roam the prairie. It's part of their spirit. It's part of their, their, their soul. It's, it's, it's something that's embedded in them. And of course, his claims are completely ignored by whites as well. Between 1887 and 1934, uh, about 86 million of 130 million acres of native lands are given over to whites. Um, so it's it's a, a vast amount uh, in comparison. Whatever is left over uh, is eventually whittled down in some cases. And um, you know the the presence that Native Americans have in the United States today. Um, in terms of you know the, their prominence in terms of society is uh, is greatly greatly diminished from what it was before um, and um, several historians have referred to uh, this entire time span as a holocaust of sorts right uh, as a, um, a a such a, a vast dwindling of a certain population down to virtually nothing so it's a it's an extremely sad and extremely difficult topic to uh, to expound upon. And so now we come to the period that is referred to, um, in some ways erroneously, really, as the end of the U of the frontier. Okay, we now no longer have any unexplored territories in the United States, uh, and even just in the map you see here in the background, um, all of the the areas that are kind of in this uh, yellowish gold and even red areas, uh, you see the population density in most places. Right, these areas that are the um, the red. For instance, most of those are the densely populated areas, and the further west you get, the the less and less dense it gets until you get to California. Um, this region here in the very center, where Oklahoma is, is all native territory. Okay, it's all Indian territory, and uh, this is not really. Uh, I think this is before the census actually begins to uh, count how many natives there are. So this this small chunk here, that's kind of the the white area, if I'm not mistaken, is the only native territory that's actually in existence in the U.S. at this point, compared to everything else. Um, Frederick Jackson Turner is a guy who posts uh, uh, or who publishes rather a thesis during this period, referred to as the frontier thesis saying that the, the push westward is what really explains the economic development of America in the 19th century. He says all of our economic success that we've had is due directly to this, and we should somehow celebrate it. Okay? And he's extremely controversial because, again, um, it, uh, it completely pushes out the, um, the plights of everyone else who has been slighted in this, in this regard. He says the frontier is gone, and with it has gone the closing of the first period of American history. Okay? But uh, this romantic ideal that he's trying to um, to push on people completely ignores, uh, you know, the the stories involving women, involving Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, all of whom have been, um, you know, had prejudice, have had violence inflicted upon them, uh, uh, of all different kinds. So, you know, it's 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 still a, a very much a whitewashed topic during this period. <laughs> 
And by 1900, the South and the West are very, very different from the way they were at the end of the Civil War. Uh, again, they're more developed in certain ways, and in some social ways, they have taken many steps back. Again, uh, the South has had African Americans that have been even pushed further and further and further into a corner, and the same with Native Americans, quite literally. They have been diminished into one specific area now. Um, so we, we enter into a period now where um, you know, white culture has uh, eclipsed just about everything else, and it takes a very long time for uh, for people of color to actually begin to to step up, and for women to be able to step up as well. Um, and again, if you're a Western farmer, you're no more than uh, a migrant worker chasing wages, just like anybody else in the South who is a sharecropper. Uh, you're you're considered a manual laborer, an unskilled worker, just like most of the other people in the United States. And one particular thing on a last note here, the, uh, a new uh, political movement that begins during this time period as a direct result of this, as a direct result of all of the, the marginalization of, of a vast majority of the population, white, black, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, all, uh, is a movement called populism. And uh, it's something that becomes extremely popular uh, once we get into the 20th century especially. Populism becomes uh, the, one of the first real big third-party movements in the United States um, as kind of a, an extension of organized labor in many ways, trying to restore power to the common people, right, the working class more so than anybody else. And populism has its benefits and it has its downsides. Um, the, the more we see it today, the more we start to see more racist rhetoric get put into it um, and more of kind of this nativist attitude. And again, it harkens back to this particular time period. Okay? So as we move forward now from chapter 18 into 19, um, you'll start to see more specific examples of the nativist response uh, and so forth, especially as it relates to immigration. <laughs>